Hey Eastside family, we are so glad you're joining us today. We are the Shea family. I'm Daniel. And I'm Amy. And we are thrilled to be able to welcome you to our online service. If you are a first time guest, we want to welcome you to our Eastside family. Make sure to send us an email at newguest at ebcnet.org so we can connect with you. And you can also interact with us in the comments below. Let us know where you're watching from. If you have any prayer requests, you can reach out to us right here in the comments as well. Connect with us on social media to hear more about what's happening here on our campus. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and our website. Speaking of what's happening on campus, we want to remind you that this Saturday, Eastside Weekday Preschool is hosting their annual fall market from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. You won't want to miss out on this. We'll have endless vendors, handmade gifts and crafts, holiday decor, local food, raffle prizes, and more. It'll be a great event for the whole family, so make sure to mark your calendars and join us this Saturday. And another family event we want to remind you of is our annual Trunk or Treat on October 29th. Today, Pastor John kicks off a new sermon series called Switch and Bait. So let's prepare our hearts to hear from the Lord today. Once again, thank you for joining us. Now let's worship together.
let's continue to sing about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and sing this hymn together. Grace is greater than our sin. Let's sing. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds. It's your breath in the 
one more time, let's say It's your bread in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your bread in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you only Oh, you're so great Father, we just thank you this morning that we come before you and just worship you, God, and declare that your grace is greater than our sins, God, that you are a good God, that you are a God that watches over us, Father. You are sovereign over us, and it is your grace, Father God, that has set us free. You are the light in the darkness. You bring hope to the hopeless. You renew strength that is weary. Father, you bring what's dead back to life. And this morning, we just pray that as a community, God. There's so many stories, Father God, so many seasons of life that people find themselves in. And this morning, when we just declare that you are still good over that, whether it's a good season, whether it's a hard season, whether it's a season of confusion or clarity, God, when we still praise you and bring praise to you because you are a God who is seated on the throne and is still good. You saw this day and you called it good. And you call all the days of our lives good, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the seasons that arise, regardless of what happens moving forward. God, you are good. And we declare that your grace is good. Your mercy is never ending. So we thank you, God, that we can sing out, great are you, Lord. Would that be our cry? Would that be the cry in our heart? to sing over and over when we don't believe it, when we have a hard time proclaiming that, that we would just still lift our voice, lift our prayer, lift our hands and say, you are still a great God. You are a good God. Can I just hear you say that this morning? Say, God, you are a great God. Just believe that over your life. He is a great God. He is for you. He's not against you. And we just pray that this morning. So Father, we lift up our worship. Continue speaking to us. Continue letting us worship in spirit and in truth through our giving, through our teaching, through community, through praise. We love you, we worship you, and you are good. Amen. Before, before we say hi to our neighbor, can we do just this one thing? Can we say this phrase, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. Can we do that this morning? Can we say God is good, or no, what? all the time, God is good. God is good. Amen. Believe that over your life. Declare that. Say hi to the people next to you. Give them a big wave, a big greeting. We're so glad you're here. It's a great Sunday to be worshiping. everyone. Today we begin a brand new series that I've entitled Bait and Switch. A little bit more about that reasoning for the title in a moment. Basically, today we're going to be looking at occultism. This series itself is a, is a series on the snares of the devil. We're talking here about the tricks of Satan the things, the traps that our enemy lays out for all of us. These are the enticements, the snares, the temptations where he tries to trip us up so that we will not glorify God and head down a path that will cause us great, great harm. I call this Satan's bait and switch. I call the series this because if you think about a bait and switch in business, it basically is an unethical business practice. Uh, it's when you advertise goods, maybe a service, 
for really a bargain basement price. And with it, then the person comes in to say they'd like to purchase it at that price. And then you attempt as a salesperson to substitute it, saying that that product is no longer available, but I have something else here, but that just happens to also cost more money. So I baited you to get in, and then I switched the selling price or the point of sale. I'll say that you were, for example, a car dealer advertising a rock bottom price for an SUV. It usually goes for thousands of dollars more than what you're advertising it for. And so you show up at the car lot and you talk to the car salesman, you want to see that car, but oh man, I'm so sorry, that car was sold yesterday or just a couple of hours ago, it pulled off the lot. Don't have anything else like that, but I can show you what I do have. It's always more, it's always more expensive. That is, if you will, in an ethical business practice, a bait and switch. Now, friends, that's exactly what the devil does to us when it comes to dabbling with sin. Have an affair with that woman. Have an affair with that man. Go ahead and do this cheat here or be unethical here, and it will pay off. But when you do it, the fact of the matter is, it's a bait and switch. The enemy has baited you to, to sin this certain way, tempted you to sin this way. And in reality, when you perform that sin, when you accomplish that sin, the fruit of that sin, the cost is always higher. You will always pay a higher price. So Satan does what he does. He fools us with the bait and switch. So the enemy says, go ahead and, uh, and drink heavily tonight or pursue that monthly pleasure or that uh, momentary pleasure this month. Go and, if you will, pursue the gratification or fulfillment that comes through pornography or uh, cheat on your taxes or steal from your company. You know, pad the, uh, the, 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 the expense report with things that are more than they really should be but are uncheckable. And all of that time, Satan is trying to sell you that, to pitch you that way, baiting you that way, you are going to discover over time that he's made a fool out of you and me because the true costs are always going to be higher. This is Satan's bait and switch. And Christians can get caught up in this just like non-believers these snares are very, very available to Christ followers. These snares are very, very real. And the reality is there's thin margins here. Just one wrong decision can start you down a road with such process and exhilaration that it can lead to a destroyed testimony, even a destroyed life. Now, the fact of the matter is, lest you think there is some type of judgment or hierarchy coming from me or my voice. Fact of the matter is, and trust me on this, no one is immune. No one is immune. All of us are susceptible to these bait and switch tactics. No one. So you ask yourself the question, and that's part of what this series is for, for our benefit, is what can I do to avoid the bait and switch? Well, it helps to know some of the major areas where Satan tries to, to get influence and a hold, if you will, to, to ensnare us in sin. And what we're going to do in the next month as it leads up to Thanksgiving, we're going to take a look at not only the bait and switch tactics, but how can we as followers of Jesus have freedom over these sins that can easily beset us, weigh us down, or trip us up. Well, let's, let's look in these days at uh, some of these temptations that we'll discuss. We're, we're, we're going to be looking at the issue of greed. That's going to be a prominent issue that we'll study. We're going to look at uh, sinful pleasures. We're going to be looking at some things that at first you look at lightly, but can become addictions and can be paralyzing in your life. We're going to look at sexual sin or sexual sins. 
and talk about some of those areas and relationships, what God's design for sexuality is and how it can get out of bounds so easily in our culture today. And then we want to focus on the subject of the hour, and that is occultism, or the occult, the world of darkness, the world of Satan, demonic powers, where darkness operates and where it functions. And I think with Halloween approaching and getting so very, very close on the calendar, it's important for us to talk about the bait and switch that happens with occultism. Now, occultism is a sin that you may think you, you, you can manage, but the price of trying to manage it as opposed to staying away from it is much higher than what the enemy tells us it is as we dabble. It's a bait and switch. Now, here's what we know when we study the Word of God. There are powerful thoughts that Satan uses to inject into our minds, right? Powerful. Have you, have you ever just been in a situation and you, where did that thought come from? You meet someone, you hear something, you're watching something, or you're just there and your, your mind suddenly goes, where in the world did that come from? Well, in the economy of God, in his providence, in his sovereignty, God allows the enemy to be able to inject thoughts into our minds. Now, we are not powerless to deal with them, but nevertheless, we have this flesh, we have this unredeemed body, unredeemed, if you will, minds. Future glorification, future redemption is going to come for these bodies and minds. But as we are there, Satan will inject. There's an interesting story of Ananias and his wife Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. And they are lying to God and they're lying to the church. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 3, here is what the writer has to say. Peter says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Instead of appearing before us as the person he really is, Satan, which would be terrifying if we really were revealed what he was and what his presence would be like, what Satan does is he fills our minds, he fills our thoughts, he fills our our hearts with sinful images that are incredibly attractive. Sound familiar? That's part of his tactic. And uh, you know what I mean by this. This is how he functions. And he does it in our culture in incredible ways. And he is really doing that today and has been for decades now in the area of media. As media has become this, this area that all of us have access to, and through the last 50 years, we've just seen an acceleration of Satan's influence, dabbling in the darkness, dabbling with the occult in media. When I was born in 1958, um, basically at that time, there were no mainstream media shows uh, that, that made the occult desirable. All you had some appeals in science fiction, shows in the early 60s like um, the Outer Limits or the Twilight Zone. You might have the uh, occasional monster movies in the 1960s. There was uh, comedies about monsters or monsters families called the Munsters, and then there was the Adams Family, but they were campy comedies. You did have in motion pictures uh, some of the things like... Uh, Frankenstein or The Mummy or I Was a Teenage Werewolf. These, these, these were things that were kind of like monster movies, but you really had to make an effort in the theater to go to see them. And you just didn't see many TV shows where, if you will, anything with dark, brutal violence was, was available. It just wasn't there. It was, it, it was not mainstreamed, if you will, like today. Now, if you know your television history, the um, first real mainstream television effort to celebrate witchcraft and warlocks was a show called Bewitched, starring a beautiful actress at that time named Elizabeth Montgomery 
and she was a witch that was married to a mortal. His name was Darren. And it was a huge, huge hit on ABC television in the early, mid to uh, late 1960s. Uh, it started out in black and white and moved into color around 1965, 1966. Highly successful. But here's what it did. It, it, it made the world of witches and warlocks fun. They were attractive figures. They were funny. It was campy comedy, but uh, it was all these characters in her family that were blipping in and out, and she would wiggle her nose and things like this would happen. Then they had a beautiful little baby who also turned out to be cute. Her name, I think, was Tabitha, and, and she was a witch as well, and we would see her move things across the room from her baby carriage, and there was a laugh track in the background, not done before a live audience, but it just made everything comical and enduring and likable. Sounds innocent enough. By the late 1960s, there was a, a move by Hollywood and those that were in the industry to begin to explore the area of demonic power beyond witches and warlocks in comedy to some very serious and troubling scripts. One of the most famous movies of 1966, uh, 1968, pardon me, where the darkness of the occult was depicted was a movie called Rosemary's Baby. You probably have seen that movie. It's been 50 plus years since it came out. And it made a big, big splash about a woman who was carrying a child that was a demon seed. And she was being followed and protected by devil worshipers. Now, where everything really took on to a whole nother level was in 1973 with a motion picture, The Exorcist. And in The Exorcist, you had for the first time mainstream scripts being written, heavily marketed, popular theme song that was played, uh, uh, the soundtrack that was played on predominantly FM radio. The Exorcist just went through the roof in the box office. In fact, it was the very first um, horror film that was nominated for Best Picture for an Academy Award, and it is all about demon possession. So troubling and so disturbing that it, it was just covered all across the nation in media, print media and radio and television at that time, so controversial that it created an enormous stir. But what that movie did, along with Rosemary's Baby did, was it helped, if you will, feed a market now going to theaters where you intentionally were watching demonic activity, demon possession. Uh, and every time another movie came out, there were more progressions. In the 1980s, early 1980, there was a movie called Friday the 13th that came out. And Friday the 13th, you know now, which was 40-something years ago, there are now, you know, you know, Friday the 13th Part 77. It was enormously successful. It has had sequels all through the years with different characters. But Friday the 13th took evil and darkness and death and slashing and stabbing and murder and beheading it took everything to another level. A precursor to that that became, that was successful a couple years before that was Halloween, uh, the motion picture Halloween with Jamie Lee Curtis. Fast forward to today as we're here in this culture, if you go to theaters, a new Halloween, probably 20 Halloweens later, is now available where you are uh, once again exposed to, we're gonna kill, we're gonna do, is darkness to scare you. Uh, horrific images, and all of that has, if you will, an echo of, of darkness, violence, and graphic screens, um, scenes. So from 1960s to, to, to today, when the genre started back then, and you fast forward to now, even with this latest Halloween release that you can see advertised on television as we watch the the Braves victoriously move on, we hope, through the, the, the league championship series. You'll see this advertised. What is it celebrating? What are these genres doing? They celebrate death. They celebrate darkness. They celebrate murder. Think of the zombie shows and all of those platforms all about dead people coming to life. Possession. 
some about demon activity, etc. It is so now a part of culture that we have comedies made called scary movies, parts one, two, three, four, however they've done, because it's become such a part of our culture. But I want, as a Christ follower, as someone who believes the Bible, to just say to you Christ followers who believe the Bible with me, this is the bait and switch. This is the slow work of the enemy that can take a culture that had none of this, if you will, or just a little bit of it in some dark corners in the 1950s. And by the time we get ready now to move into 2022, it has become a major multi-billion dollar enterprise. Build scripts and stories around darkness. There's even a Geico commercial. I don't know if you've seen it, where these kids, teenagers, are running around trying to hide from a guy who has a chainsaw with a mask that's going to try to kill them. And they are making all kinds of stupid, silly mistakes. And it's just campy. And we laugh about it. And I'm not being legalistic. I'm not being narrow. I, I, I'm just trying to say to you thoughtfully, look at the strategy of Satan. And how you can take something so dark and so negative and so powerfully wicked and take themes and tie it all into hellish forces and make them commercial successes. Now, there are some things that as a pastor, as a Christ follower, that have been mainstreamed today that perhaps for the first time in your life, you've heard, you're gonna hear that you should stay away from. And I want to try to build a biblical case for that in the remaining time that we have together. There are some things that are attached to the occult, to hell, demons, Satan, Lucifer, the liar, that you need to avoid. So here's just a few of them that I would encourage you to stay away from, and if you're in them, you need to abandon them right away. The first would be witchcraft. Witchcraft. Um, according to Atlantic Magazine, Atlantic Magazine, witchcraft in our nation is on the rise. Spell casting, they say in the article, rises as trust in establishment ideas plummet. Top among costumes this year for Halloween, which produces about a $9 billion revenue stream during this time. Costumes, the number one costume for adults and among the number one costumes for children will be witches' costumes. There are in the United States, according to data, 1.5 million witches who are part of Wicca, W-I-C-C-A. This is paganistic. This is about casting spells. We moved a long way from the beautiful Samantha Stevens of Bewitched to people who may very well be your neighbors who are conjuring up spells and calling on the forces of darkness to bring something of quality into their lives. Stay away from witchcraft. There's another thing where you should stay away, and which you stay away, and that would be astrology. Now, that may be a stunner or shocker for some of you. Astrology in our country today is about a $2.2 billion industry. It's gotten an, another boom during um, COVID-19 where people have been staying home. Can I just remind you that if you're trying to find the will for your future outside of God, and you are a Christ follower, you are, are, are in disobedience to Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Here's what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You should not consult any source outside of what is in the biblical framework about your future. In Isaiah 47, there is a powerful passage. Give me a moment to, to turn to the Old Testament. In Isaiah 47, verses 12 through 15, 
I want you to look at the words of the prophet Isaiah, who's telling a group of people, you're finding reliance, you're finding reliance in all of these things related to the stars and stargazing and studying the stars. You keep that up, he almost says here, if you will, sarcastically, and you're going to regret it. Here's what he says in verse 12 of Isaiah 47. This is the word of God. Keep on then with your magic spells and with your sorceries, many sorceries, which you have labored at since childhood. Perhaps you will succeed. Perhaps you will cause terror. All the counsel you have received has only worn you out. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month. Let them save you from what is coming upon you. Surely they are like stubble. The fire will burn them up. They can't save themselves from the power of the flame. These are not coals for warmth. This is not a fire to sit by. Stay away from the astrologist. Daily horoscopes. Psychic hotlines. Palm readers. You know the sign on the road, you'll see them on South Cobb Drive and others. Come in and see Sister Marie and she'll read your psalm, your, your, your palms. And... Uh, Tarot cards and tell you about your future and make all these grand and general statements about you and your life. And in the atmosphere of that, you're going, whoa, wow. It's dark. Stay away. Whether they are sincere or whether they are outright charlatans or crooks, God is not amused by you consulting dark sources like stargazers and astrologers. In um, Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, hear the word of God. When you enter the land the Lord your God has given you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, that's paganism, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive you out of those, out, out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord. The Word of God. Let me give you a third area which I would encourage you to stay away from. Yes, witchcraft. Yes, astrology. Third area to stay away from would be New Age healing. I would add to this just the New Age ideas. We used to call that the New Age movement. It's become a little bit more stated compared to when it was a newer phenomenon. But New Age healing is something to be very, very cautious of. And you're going to find that there is a whole market uh, and an industry out there about New Age. You see it in the bookstores, right? You have Christian books. You have history books. Look there in the bookstores if you still go to one as opposed to online. And you're going to see a whole group of books, a lot of them on New Age issues. So we're talking here about crystals, psychic therapies, self-hypnosis. Here, here's the danger, my friend. When you open up your mind to any other power than God, you're, you're, you're in a danger zone. It's a, it's a bait and switch. What might seem cool and appealing and hip, so attractive, and maybe it doesn't cost you much, but the cost over time will be severe. If you're involved in anything that teaches you that you are a little God, that you have within you your own aspects of divinity, you are in danger. If you are being taught that you yourself are a self-healer, that you have the power to heal, that is heading for trouble. Time is moving on and I must too. Here's a fourth area you should stay away from in this area of the occult and that is hallucinogenic drugs. Back uh, right around World War II, what became the CIA and uh, other government officials were 
working on mind-altering drugs and put together, if you will, LSD. LSD is probably the first publicly known, discussed, mind-altering drug that mainstreamed in society, became incredibly popular when I was a kid during the drug revolution of the uh, mid to late 1960s and early 1970s. What this and other hallucinogenic drugs do is it, uh, it expands your mind and it also immobilizes your will. You, you just, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're opening yourself up to. It's all an attempt, if you will, to expand your consciousness, to bring down your defenses. It's mind altering. It is there to, in your system, to alter your mind. And at some point, Satan can enter into that open mind like that and cause you great harm. I mean, many are the stories of people who took that, dropped acid, had LSD, and did it, and, 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 and later it stays in the system, and then again it brings about an ignition of another mind-altering experience. I, I, I just want to say to you, it, it doesn't matter how glamorized or how legalized certain things become, as a Christ follower, stay sober. Stay away from chemicals that can alter your mind. You open yourself up to all kind of vulnerabilities in the world of darkness. Another thing that I think has been in the last 20 years a real acceleration where people are looking at other things as opposed to looking to Jesus Christ and the teachings from the Word of God is I would encourage you to beware of an overbelief in angels. Now, I understand that a show touched by an angel that came on years ago and probably still in syndication and cable. I understand how that kind of wholesome view and somewhat divine uh, heavenly aspect is better than so much that's on television. I, I, I get that as a consumer. I just want you to have filters and to make sure that you're very, very careful to understand that our hope is not in angels. Our hope is in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for our sins. It's statistically proven over the last 25 years there has been a rise in the popularity of angels. But here's a problem and you need to remember it. The Bible teaches that there are two different kinds of angels. There are good angels and there are bad angels. Bad angels are fallen angels. They're demons. They are demonic powers. And sometimes evil angels, can, dark angels, can disguise themselves as angels of light. And sometimes we find that even Paul warned us that evil spirits, evil demon angels, they can do miracles, and they can accomplish the purposes of Satan. And Satan is Lucifer, and he is the chief fallen angel. You don't want to go there. You don't want to open up yourself where you're praying to an angel, or you're relying on an angel, or that's my angel, or my angel's going to help me get through it. That's, that, that's, that's hogwash. Don't go there. You're dabbling in darkness. The, la the last one, and, 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 there, and there are many more, and, and, and this is simply an area where the occult can really show itself is, is in certain genres and lyrics in music. Not all music, not all lyrics. But let's be intellectually honest and historically aware, and let's just be truthful enough to recognize that there are certain genres of music that promote darkness, certain lyrics of music 
that promote darkness. Now, immediately you want to you go after certain aspects of rock. Okay, that's fine. Not all, but some. But with all due respect to conservative friends who love country music, some of the filthiest languages and suggestions are found in that lyrical genre. Not all, but some. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about any kind of lyric that finds people rebelling against God, promoting rebellion against God, that, that promotes rebellion against God-ordained institutions, that promote a higher life of, of sex and drugs, false religion, and as you get that out into the world, and music is powerful. Music is incredibly powerful. Lyrics are powerful. I heard one guy say that what's today's lyrics 10 years from now will be government's social policy. It has that kind of impact. And if you aren't careful and you find yourselves, you are listening to and, and, and taking this in, and you're allowing yourself if you will, to, to, to let the enemy break down resistance to immorality, to break down resistance to decency, to break down resistance to marriage, is troubling. Not all. Of course not. But some. And we know it when we hear it, if we're conscious of it. And again, it's, it's any genre. Rock, pop, hip-hop, country. It can let down defenses and be a bait and switch. Now, at the heart of musical defiance is simply rebellion, anti-authority, anti-God. Here's what God said through Samuel or, uh, to King Saul in 1 Samuel 25, 1 Samuel 20, 15, pardon me, verse 23. Give me a moment to, to get over there. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 25, for rebellion is like the sin of divination or witchcraft, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry, because you have rejected the word of God he has rejected you, Saul, as king. Now, please don't tag me. Please don't tag me. I know that in which I speak. I understand the music industry. I know how it works. And I am not saying anything even close that all music is the, outside the church is the devil's music. I don't believe that. But I do believe that there are some lyrics and that there are some structures in which music is played that basically gives the devil, the enemy, an opportunity to have access. And I know you love your music. But I just want to, because I love you, my name is John and I'm your friend, I want you to be careful when it comes to this issue of certain, certain genres of music and lyrics. So what does all this mean? Well, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ in this world today, basically, folks, we're going against the grain, aren't we? I mean, you talk about a minority position. This is a sermon that would get booed off the stage of any major audience or studio-based talk show. This is a minority position. But here's what Paul said to us who are in the minority as Christ followers. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the might of his power or mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you, Christ follower, can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He says here, for our struggle 
is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. But our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is our battle cry. It may be a minority position in this world. It may make us an unusual, peculiar, set-apart, separate people. But this is our battle cry for the redeemed. We have been called to participate in the spiritual warfare around us to stand and to resist. The devil and his fallen angels are organized. They never stop trying to harass us, to discourage us, to defeat us. But Christ calls on us to stand. I read this week that Napoleon Bonaparte once spread a map of a table in front of all of his men. He put his finger down on a portion of the map and he said, Sirs, if it were not for that one red spot, I would have conquered the world. His finger was placed on the British Isles. Someone wrote in the same way, I am certain the devil gathers his lieutenants around him puts his map on the table, points at Calvary where the blood of Jesus Christ was shed and said, Sirs, if it were not for that one red spot, I would conquer the world. We have been called to be conquerors in Christ. Just some quick things before we're done. If you have in your possession... Ouija boards. If you have been dabbling with Dungeons and Dragons or horoscopes and horoscope books, if you've been participating with violent video games, if you have been listening to music or watching movies that glorify violence due to some type of satanic twist, if you are involved in voodoo or black magic, spell books, tarot cards, in some forms, again, of lyrics and styles of music that conjure up darkness. It's time to get rid of that. Flirting, dancing with, dating with that kind of paranormal stuff can bring you down. I want to close with James chapter 4, verse 7. Run a little longer today than other Sundays, but my goodness, there's so much here. In James chapter 4, verse 7, here's what he says. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. Stand, resist, and he will flee from you. There is a demonic world around us. You cannot have your head in the sand for the sake of your own lives, for your children, your grandchildren. Be aware that we're in a war and we have been called to stand for Christ, for light in the midst of the darkness. God bless you and thanks for listening. What a great time of worship together. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope to see you next Sunday at 9.30 and 11 a.m. or 4 and 6 p.m. We love you, Eastside family. Hope you have a great week.